Okay. Um, well, I'm really honored uh, to, uh, to welcome both of you, Jesse Reiser and Nanako Umamoto. Um, as principals of uh, your practice, RUR based in New York, uh, we're really grateful for the generosity to, to, for your time, for our small group of our seminar. Um, this is the first of six recorded sessions of uh, presentations, interviews uh, in this graduate research seminar. So what we're doing in the seminar is researching pioneering technology and its impact on contemporary architectural practice. And the course uh, explores six contemporary modes of practice, uh, six practices, six projects, six seminal built projects, uh, very much at the frontiers of design, production and construction technology. And the focus of the initial offering of the course, and this is the very first of, of these interviews and, and, and sessions, um, we're focusing on the architectural envelope as a mode of comparison of um, the application of technology and, and, and its expression through six uh, seminal projects and their envelopes. Uh, most of these projects are all within the first 20 years of, the, of this relatively new century. Uh, and the performance of architectural skins um, is the focus of the comparison um, and they're understood as cultural, technical, experiential, thermal, et cetera, uh, analyzed across uh, several, uh, six thematic classifications. Those are the first one being uh, materiality and massing, uh, then modularity and mass customization, form and geometry, climate and energy, uh, visuality and experience, interaction and smartness. So uh, the first building of course is the uh, uh, 014 tower in Dubai. Uh, with, an, with our emphasis, at least at the analysis on uh, massing and materiality. Uh, the following sessions include the Taekwun uh, Cultural Center in Hong Kong by Herzog Demeron, Lisa Soho uh, in Beijing by Zaha Did Architects, the Bloomberg Center at Cornell Tech by Morphosis, uh, Galleria City Center in Seoul by UN Studio, and the Media Tick uh, building in Barcelona by Cloud9. Uh, so we'll, the other people are coming in to uh, present and, and be interviewed uh, are Askan Mergenthaler, who's a senior partner at Herzog Demeron, Patrick Schumacher, Scott Lee at Morphosis, Astrid Piper from UN Studio, and Enrique. <laughs> 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 Say hi. <laughs> um, uh, and well, I, I could, I mean, the, to a, a a small group like this, I could read yeah. your bio from your website, but uh, you know, I, I, your 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 practice has really been uh, emblematic of architectural experimentation for a couple of decades, uh, established by uh, both of you as as uh, as principals. Um, the fir the firm focuses on the relationship of architecture, structure, landscape, and approaches to each project as a continuation of ongoing inquiry. And this is actually really quite interesting for us in a context of an interview. Um, the, the uh, of course, uh, projects and really important projects in your office since uh, 014 uh, are the uh, Kaohsiung Port Terminal and Taipei Pop Music Center, both uh, nearing construction, I, th I think from photos I've seen online, um, it seems. Uh, and the 014 project was um, beautifully in, encapsulated in a monograph uh, published by A Publications, edited by Brett Steele uh, in 2013, called, and the book's called uh, Projection and Reception. And we, we've, uh, students have been reading uh, uh, essays within uh, that uh -huh. monograph and others as well. Um, so at, at, at this juncture, I'll pass it on to both of you, Jesse and Nanako. I'm grateful for, for you to join us today. Uh, we're also joined by David Diamond, the uh, uh, director of the MARC program, who, who, who's slipped in to, to have a treat for, to join us this morning. So over to you, Jesse and Nanako. Thank you very much. Uh, Oh, I think you'll need to make uh, us a co-host to get I have. house to Maybe. share the screen. I've just done that, sorry, yeah. Of course, I don't know, just Julian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we 
prepared um, a relatively short presentation on O14, um, you know, just to give you uh, a, a background uh, on it. Um, I suppose you've all have, have a, a, a working idea of the project. And one of the things that I think would be really important um, in this presentation, um, I guess, is to locate O14, um, you know, as a project uh, that occurred relatively early, I would say, you know, in the kind of um, within the technological ambitions of projects like this. So there were a lot of very problematic and interesting things that happened because of that. Our, you know, um, expectations about uh, the internationalization of building culture uh, uh, and about, uh, in a way, utopian hopes for automating the process, making a smooth process between the design studio and the, you know, the job site and the construction. So there were a lot of um, missteps and a lot of creative workarounds that actually had to occur in order to get the building built. So it was interesting because, you know, of course we're uh, academics and, you know, we put the ideal probably first before, uh, you know, the kind of the realities of, uh, of the work site. And so we had many hopes for the way the building would be delivered and the way it would get constructed. Uh, and that didn't always happen. So fortunately, we're also from an older generation who, you know, we started out, you know, drawing with T-squares and triangles. And uh, my mother is an architect. So uh, we had experience detailing and working in a way, very old school ways of working as well. So in reality, O14 is a, a mix, I would say, uh, very old school ways, both of uh, you know, designing, um, and we still use very old school ways of evaluating our project, and then you know um, our experiments really, and our uh, sort of entanglements with the technology, and how the two kind of come together. So yeah, this is a view of O14, probably you know very shortly after. Uh, construction. Uh, this building wouldn't even be visible anymore this way. Uh, this is situated in uh, one of the sort of micro cities of Dubai called Business Bay. Um, and really, you know, Dubai, uh, you know, in its probably post 90s manifestations is really a collection of themed uh, subsidies. Uh, you know, based on use. So they're all in a way uh, like islands, their own sort of circumscribed islands and infrastructure in the desert. So you have obviously the Palm Island, but one could consider the urbanism, uh, the new urbanism of Dubai as being island-like as well. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen this dramatic kind of shift from, you know, what the country looked like uh, in early 90s. And this, of course, it's already 15 years ago or more. Uh, and it you know, went through, of course, a downturn in 2009. And we fortunately uh, escaped uh, having our project stopped. But a lot of other projects that we had on the drawing board did stop. This was well enough along that it would continue even though there was a you know, kind of massive recession at that point. Um, the thing that we argue, you know, in the, uh, in the, the uh, AA book um, is to kind of see Dubai as part of, you know, not so dissimilar from other cities around the world, this kind of new, new form of urbanism. Uh, I don't know if one would call it generic city. Um, but it, in a way, um, had more similarity than difference, I would, I would venture, uh, from these other places like Shanghai or Kuala Lumpur. This uh, was 
an image that we received, um, we entered uh, a competition prior to 014 that basically introduced our office uh, you know, to uh, one of the developers who worked at that point for Dubai Properties, uh, Shahab Lutfi, which was, you know, was one of the big uh, development companies. 014 um, came out of uh, collaboration with Shahab. So Shahab left Dubai Properties and this was really his first Develop, independent development project. So uh, we were fortunate in that respect also because he wanted to make a splash. He was willing to entertain, you know, more speculative architecture. Um, didn't happen after that. Uh, his work, you know, the work he generally does in development is more uh, conservative and probably, you know, makes more money than 014. 014 was really, uh, you know, fortunate for us in that respect that it, he was willing, uh, you know, to push a more experimental and radical project than, you know, he normally does. Although we've kept in very close, you know, contact with Jahab. Uh, anyway, so this is Business Bay. You're confronted with a rendering uh, first. Uh, it was a competition. Um, and this is actually the kind of the difference. That's what the rendering looked like. And then we went on a site visit and that's what we confronted. So if I go back a second, that circular marker in the center uh, is this red marker. So there's really nothing there, uh, you know, when, during the competition uh, phase, um, brutally hot kind of waste ground at that point. Uh, so this is a really typical situation in Dubai. Um, uh, they would have large British uh, engineering firms with whom they've had long, you know, relationships with. Uh, uh, Hal Crow was the master planner who generated that rendering, um, and then you know um, the competition really uh, centered around. Uh, the creation of a new central building within the center of that circle. Uh, and so we were up against formidable competition. Uh, OMA ultimately proposed to buy Renaissance. Zaha uh, proposed and you know, won in the competition for her dancing towers, although they changed, um, I'm talking to Patrick, uh, they changed the program a number of times. I think it became a uh, kind of economic hub uh, for, you know, anyway, for the stock market, and then it was canceled. And then um, I never really knew up until a few years ago what Tom's proposal was, but he, uh, I contacted him for this presentation, not this one, but for a presentation, and he finally sent us his scheme. So these were 84-story tower uh, projects, there was to be mixed use um, so that you would have uh, a mix of residential and office spaces. And it was, of course, uh, like all the project in Dubai, they demanded an iconic uh, building. Um, and Shahab, uh, although we didn't win, Shahab really liked our project and his first inclination when you know, getting, uh, becoming independent uh, was to have us uh, make a proposal for, a, again, a mixed use building, but instead of uh, 84 stories, it was to be 22 stories. But he was, uh, you know, interested in uh, kind of elaborate formal development of the 22 story tower. But you know, as you all must know by this time, you know, rescaling a project um, and the sort of impact or the kind of uh, conflict between the programmatic necessity and the formal um, sort of motive doesn't work. And so we went through 16, uh, at least 16 iterations of a kind of a miniaturizing and Increasingly, the, the volume, the building mass got uh, simpler and simpler. Uh, and 
uh, I actually preferred that. Um, you know, we would put, and this, I guess, overlaps with the concern of your seminar today. We decided that, um, in a way, the treatment of the envelope was complex enough, the kind of fenestration and pattern work and its structural demands were complex enough and it, would, it was actually excessive, even on a purely aesthetic level, to begin to mix you know, a, a highly formed envelope with uh, our desires for kind of doing a structural uh, and you know, kind of surface uh, project. So it became a, a simple extrusion, a cru soft cruciform. I should also say, because things were constantly changing in terms of programmatic demand, the original scheme um, was a mixed use scheme. So there were to be uh, apartments occupying you know, 11 stories of this 22 story project and then office space down below. So um, in that earlier iteration, um, the first 11 stories bulged and created a, you know, a kind of um, a less cruciform uh, point. And then from 11 to 22, the cruciform became more uh, uh, you know, kind of deep. And that allowed for duplex apartments and wraparound views for each of these apartments. Um, and then because the market changed, uh, we eliminated, uh, Shahab eliminated the residential component and it became all offices. And so the extrusion then uh, became even more simple, straight. And it allowed them also to, uh, you know, in terms of working with the concrete, ultimately, to slip the building up using the same formwork and uh, wouldn't have to deal with continuously changing formwork and construction. So the first proposal actually, uh, you can see, yeah, that kind of residential duplex thing uh, was a more conventional, um, you know, uh, curtain wall facade. Uh, and uh, we kind of went through the iterations of that, um, reached a kind of, and you can see actually even more uh, alto-like, um, form making in that early model as well. So it wasn't a pure extrusion even at that point. Um, but then we had a kind of crisis in the design and pulled back, especially once we shifted to pure office uh, and began to think through another way of dealing with um, a set of demands that would in a sense be added to a steel and, well, you know, a kind of curtain wall project. So sunscreening and so forth um, would have to be you know, like an additional element. The structural part um, was more conventional in the early thing. So we, we pulled back and began to rethink what a building in that climate uh, should be like. Uh, and also, we're really interested in combining, you know, the structural performance with the sunscreening and a whole, you know, set of other kind of concerns. But it was a gradual process, and there were actually some really interesting. Uh, I guess I wouldn't call it accidental, but it was sort of the coming together of a bunch of concerns, which finally led to, um, you know, the final um, configuration of the building. So. Yeah, notionally, this animation shows the way in which the structure essentially goes to the perimeter, becomes incorporated, you know, in a um, in a structural uh, shell. So there are no no internal columns to the building. Our engineer for the project was Israel Sinek, who is actually our professor of structures at the Cooper Union, um, and. Izzy actually um, was one of the main engineers for the Trump Tower. He was the engineer for Donald Trump's tower. He also did um, 
casino in Atlantic City. He, he was involved, he's a, he was a Cuban uh, who actually did the famous hotels um, in Cuba. And so he had, um, you know, before the Batista regime fell. So he had a, a really high expertise in concrete design, which he was always frustrated in in America. So this for him was a chance to really, uh, you know, kind of stretch his muscles with um, doing a thin concrete shell as structure. And the idea really was, uh, you know, similar to that of a nuclear uh, power plant where um, you had a kind of a, a, a thin, uh, you know, a, well, be, yeah, an outer shell that was very stiff. It could deal with gravity and lateral forces that would make um, the core relatively light. You wouldn't have to deal with those demands uh, and essentially everything would be taken, you know, by this uh, exoskeleton. And um, there were also, you know, um, kind of parallels to projects by you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, where uh, in the St. Mark's Tower, it's more of a trunk and tray model. Essentially, O14 inverts that model. Uh, not that we were explicitly looking at Frank Lloyd Wright at the time. Uh, but when you see the two together, basically those are kind of inverse uh, projects. And yeah, there were earlier iterations um, where the structural diagrid um, from the contractor, contractor early on um, thought it would be better to turn the diagrid horizontal in terms of constructability. We were totally against it. I mean, it lost, well, first of all, it wouldn't work as a diagrid. Uh, it would work as a series, I guess, of somewhat like beer and deal trusses. Um, but we also aesthetically, you know, were, it just, it seemed, uh, it lost the kind of visual and the kind of structural dynamic when you turn uh, that system horizontal. Anyway, we went through some exercises there, and fortunately, Sinek came to the rescue, you know, being the engineer and convinced the, uh, the contractor that doing the diagrid was, as he would say, was a piece of cake. Of course, it wasn't a piece of cake, but he was an extremely convincing uh, kind of interlocutor. Um, so this is a uh, uh, kind of close up detail of, um, of the project. There's a uh, connection from the uh, exoskeleton to the slabs is through this series of, of tongues that we call them. And then there was an air gap between you know, the two that was essentially, um, it was originally designed, um, that gap was really, to create a space for window washing. Um, the uh, exoskeleton uh, is not glazed, the holes are open. And then there was a, a, a more economical window wall that set back uh, a meter, uh, which you know, kind of created the environmental enclosure. But it also, that gap uh, rather fortuitously at first, uh, became uh, allowed for the stack effect and the kind of reduction in the cooling. But it was not um, at first, you know, part of the intention. It was in a way a happy accident. I think. But anyway, we were looking, and I mean, this would have been for years, on, uh, you know, um, kind of organic uh, structure and form as well as, uh, you know, precedents, uh, you know, related to kind of holy <laughs> architecture, but also, you know, um, structures that uh, were, uh, had lacuna, had gaps in it that, um, you know, would provide a kind of exchange of light and air and so forth. And, you know, there were popular uh, reactions to our project, 
this was all over the web, you know, so it's like inevitable, I suppose. And when we presented it in Moscow, the Russians were absolutely convinced that we had been looking at uh, Melnikov, which we hadn't, but it resonates, you know, with these things. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, is part of the economy of this work um, is the idea that you're dealing um, with a high level of redundancy. I mean, once you work with the diagrid, it has uh, you know, certain kind of virtuous properties, right? I mean, that, um, I don't know if you can see that image on the upper left, but that's um, a Wellington bomber that I was, you know, it was an airplane that had a geodetic uh, kind of basket weave structure. And one of the virtues of that structure, uh, which in this cartoon shows that large portions of the structure could literally be blown away in combat and the structure, the forces would reroute through a highly redundant system and, you know, find a way of working unless, you know, it was completely, you know, removed. So um, that, uh, of course, uh, we hope doesn't happen with the building, but what it does do is it gives us a fair amount of flexibility in terms of how uh, we could modulate the openings of the building and still have uh, you know, the, the, um, the structure work. So much of the really interesting interchange that we had with the engineer, with Sinex office was in um, kind of balancing um, the aesthetics or functional um, drive uh, to Kind of putting larger holes one place or moving the pattern around um, and still have the project work. So there was also at that point in that kind of negotiation, even um, factoring in of the concrete strength. So, you know, the first iteration dealt with a lower strength concrete. Um, and then when they sort of turned the dial and went to a higher strength concrete, it suddenly opened up our kind of uh, freedom to move the pattern around, get them to drift. They were really, uh, it was not, uh, it was a diagrid of course, but we actually uh, had a fair amount of freedom to move those openings around within a certain boundary, which increased as you increase the concrete strength. So it was really interesting, you know, that way as a, you know, it was a new kind of experience in iterative production working with uh, the engineer. And I like to show this, this was actually, um, these uh, on the left uh, was an analysis done at Princeton by my colleague, Dee Nordenson, um, who had the students uh, look at Les Robertson's uh, structural design for the World Trade Center. Um, and it was a really interesting, you know, uh, kind of comparison to me to sort of look at uh, what you're seeing in that rainbow are the different um, strengths of steel in the trade center. So in the case of the, of the trade center, they kept all of the members and proportions exactly the same, but then the forces on those members were different. And so they, you know, changed the strength of the steel while keeping all the dimensions constant. Um, our project in a funny way is a kind of uh, inverse of that. I mean, we were um, interested in much, in, you know, in high variation in the geometry and in, uh, you know, a, at least a, a, a freedom in changing scale. Uh, and so uh, we would need to dial up concrete strength uh, to do that. And there was just a completely different kind of economy and workflow uh, compared to, you know, the, the, the trade center model. But this is, you know, it's quite similar in that respect. So this is more a representational in, uh, phenomena, which I think is probably even more prevalent today. Certainly you see it in a lot of Zaha's work. The strangeness, um, uh, like kind of the closeness of the rendering to the built building that, you know, uh, and I think that's also, you know, kind of tied to the technologies we're using today, that kind of uh, uh, 
connection between the design and the construction and then um, you know how we're getting the strange effect of a built of a built rendering which is very kind of even more stunning in a way when you're out there and the building actually looked the most material in construction uh it sort of you know it, it went through different states let's say uh so yeah this is um the kind of uncanniness of the project in the city uh, was something that you know we weren't entirely um, in control of, but it was simply a kind of after effect of you know uh, of using this way of designing and delivering a building to a site uh, and how it could affiliate in really interesting ways to. Uh, you know, ground and sky and uh, the urban context in ways that the more conventional uh, kind of curtain wall buildings don't. So yeah, a massive number of iterations. We actually were trying to fight against obvious readings of the dire grid uh, to sort of slow down your perception. So. Uh, we were really interested in the kind of trickling tear effect. Sinek called it, yeah, kind of trickle down force model where the diagrid isn't so explicitly expressed on the facade uh, by varying, you know, the kind of densities of concrete or openings. You wouldn't have an obvious, you know, kind of pattern. So we were working a lot with that. And then, you know, there were resonances with um, op art and pop up art, I suppose, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the effect, especially in kind of near oblique views um, of uh, kind of the flipping of up and down and um, yeah, the, just the kind of opti optical effects, um, you know, of this kind of pattern making. And so, yeah, there was a lot of work done. Um, there, we had a very good lighting designer um, who gave us, uh, you know, because this had a gap, uh, it was really easy to light the building in interesting ways. So kind of the backlighting of the building and the washing of the face. Um, yeah, this is an argument that uh, I kind of mounted um, about uh, where this building lodges. Um, I'm really interested in the notion of expression. Expressionism, of course, in the early part of the century was um, beaten down. It was seen as a kind of secondary manifestation of modernism. But with the new technologies, issues of expression, um, I think, uh, become, you know, very uh, crucial. And so, yeah, I mean, just cutting across from the two extremes, because modernism was interested in, uh, you know, expression of skin and bones in a building. And on the other side, there is a legacy, you know, recent legacy of um, expressionism, which would be more of an, a kind of an athletic uh, way of using structural expression uh, to kind of define, uh, you know, building a kind of heroic uh, use of structure, and ours fought fell into this intermediate category, I would argue, uh, which I would connect to um, a kind of cosmetics. So while we're dealing with materials and forces, we're also dealing with um, maybe more subtle issues of appearance uh, and the production of. Um, you know, kind of strange effects as opposed to, you know, athletic, athleticism or, um, I don't know, honesty in skin and bones. And you see that in, in cosmetics, that, you know, the indexical work on the body uh, connects directly to the decorative as well. And the use of the complex pattern um, allows for a kind of contradictory 
uh, reading of the building, we hope. I think it does work, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, I remember, you know, because I was in Rome in the mid 80s on a Rome prize, really being shocked by the pyramid of uh, Cestius uh, because it was so featureless uh, and because of the smog in the city, you really couldn't tell how big that pyramid was. From certain views, it looked, you know, absolutely gigantic. But then when you got, you know, close to it, you realized it was a relatively small pyramid. Um, so that would be kind of characteristic of the monolith. And O14, in a way, incorporates a, a monolithic idea. Uh, but with a disruptive, what you could call a kind of camouflage or a disruptive pattern, which tends to, you know, which is in a way the use of camouflage is to break form up to um, make very ambiguous the relationship of, you know, the object to its context. So we were sort of balancing both uh, motives in the project. Oh, I don't know. Oh, this is my turn. Yeah, you can yeah. say whatever you want. So this is the, I think, the under construction of O14, among the other buildings. And you can see the Burj Khalifa, which is tallest building in Dubai. So you can see the, the uh, relationship of each buildings. But this point, I actually, this, uh, the, you see the, the front, a yard it's supposed to be a river, which is not there yet. And then this is 22 story buildings. And usually Dubai has a, this typology that you uh, they put a podium in front and in the back there, that's the parking garage. And then you can go up the, uh, the uh, certain height to the two to the site. And then uh, our case, we uh, convince our client, we should see from front to the back, go through so we can create the public space and then uh, we can get into the water view and the water, enjoy the water. And then uh, we push the uh, parking garage in the basement. So it's become a tower and a podium around it for two-story building, but we have a public space connecting front to yard. Right, so it connects a back street with a waterfront esplanade. So the, the idea of having a parking structure blocked the two, we were able to convince you know, the developer that it would be much smarter to spend the extra money and sink the parking and make this a really kind of, a, a kind of gateway to the esplanade. So yeah, this is a George Tucker painting, but this was the other um, ambition, I would say, um, for the variegated office space. Um, the kind of anomie and the uh, isolation in a normal office plan was something we really didn't want to encourage. And so the argument we were making and of course, we couldn't really control the interior layouts because those were tenants. But the ideal, anyway, was to have an envelope that would have a variegated uh, set of uh, sort of atmospheres. So there would be brighter zones and then dimmer zones. And so there would be, given a free plan, there would be a different way of organizing the office and, and office routines than a grid-based model, let's say, that you would find in you know, the normative office tower. Of course, this was, again, one of those utopian things that you have to have a willing uh, tenant to respond you know, to the fenestration. But that was the idea that it would be almost a kind of tropism. Uh, people would um, organize uh, offices uh, according to their needs uh, depending upon the light level and views out. Uh, in the actual building, most of the tenants uh, are more conventional, both in their kind of design aesthetic and in the way they organize their offices, but it's there. So if there is a more experimental tenant, 
they could be more responsive in a sense, uh, you know, to the fenestration. But anyway, it was a kind of uh, critique, I would say, of mid-century, mid-last century gridded uh, organizing of, you know, office towers, both in the elevations and in the plans. So um, we, uh, we have a, a normal cornfield for the parking garage. Uh, and then uh, we put the big slab and on top of that, we created the footings of the uh, O14. And so that uh, the, it's, so it's become very big beams. Yeah, there's a so massive that, ring beam that uh, collects all of the, you know, the forces from the tower and then you know, brings them to the gridded yeah. uh, structure of the parking garage below. But the, because of that, O14 is exoskeleton, which is structural. So we can avoid to have any columns in the interior field. And then there were, yeah, I mean, this is part of the whole um, uh, um, experimental exercise in a way of um, how the building would get built. And so, there was a um, an initial idea about reusable molds out of rubber um, uh, and how many could be repeated. And of course you have a changing geometry and plan. So, um, and uh, a series of, you know, opening types as well. So we went through a lot of exercises about the reusable molds uh, and you know, these are some, you know, kind of others, uh, you know, how to kind of create those void forms. Um, ultimately, uh, the, um, the formwork company that was Chinese, actually, they were, they had a, um, uh, you know, a little factory on site where they would, you know, uh, use automated wire, uh, you know, cutting of foam uh, to cut the void forms, they decided that it was economically more feasible to make all of these waste molds. So in other words, um, they would be used once and then they would be smashed out with sledgehammers actually yeah. once the concrete hardened. But there was a lot of work um, because it was an unusual project. Um, the first stories took much longer until they really kind of got the system down, you know, how to kind of locate the forms efficiently, the placement of the reinforcement. Um, we, you know, used a, an extremely, um, it was called a self-consolidating concrete, which could, you know, penetrate all of the, uh, you know, the density of the reinforcement and get around everything. And what you see around those white styrofoam forms, um, is the result of a kind of a series of failures that happened in the first story. The pressure of the concrete in the pore, of course, would increase towards the bottom of the pore. And so they found that that styrofoam, since it wasn't that rigid, uh, was deforming. And so uh, in the second uh, stories and thereafter, they used a kind of melamine laminate, which they kind of taped to the void form so that they wouldn't compress. So yeah, you can see here, you know, form a form removed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so each forms are destroyed. And so, uh, you know, I mentioned this briefly, you know, that gap uh, between the uh, Exoskeleton. The exoskeleton and the, the you know, closed wall. building, you know, generates a stack effect, um, and the uh, environmental person estimated around twenty to thirty uh, percent cooling costs. There's not a heating, you know, problem in Dubai, but the cooling, of course, is meaningful. So, and there is, I mean, this is more um, subjective, but when you go to the bottom of the building, there's a continuous breeze uh, generated by the stack. You've got a kind of cooling effect. There's an updraft around the base of the building in the public space. 
which is actually very nice. So this just sort of shows what happened. In reality, any vertical surface, even a telephone pole will have a stack effect, but the, you know, the kind of gap in between um, you know, accelerates that. Okay, yeah, this is a kind of, um, I wanna sort of come clean and clear about how the gap happened. Um, in the first iterations of O14, um, there was no gap between a window wall and the outer shell. Uh, the, the slab went right up to the exoskeleton and we were contemplating glazing each one of the holes. Uh, and there were penalties on two levels. One was um, enormously costly uh, glazing because you know there's constantly changing geometry. The other uh, was uh, uh, details that I really objected to as well. Um, you know, very fat, fat uh, framing around the glazing. So uh, what really motivated um, you know, the change uh, had to do with both cost and aesthetics. And so, yeah, the second and what we actually built was to pull that glazing in, have a very relatively inexpensive window wall, which would just go from slab to slab. Um, and then because you needed to clean that glass, a one meter gap, and you know, uh, suddenly you get a stack effect. <laughs> So this is where uh, the you know the top story of the building uh, you know, on the roof where the, the uh, exoskeleton uh, is free. You can see the shell, and so there's a you know kind of a social space up at the top of the building. But it's really nice to see it. Uh, by the way, I guess the what was it? It was 60 centimeter thick on shell the at the bottom and then there's a really interesting transition level we first again use one of these things you at first we were talking about a continuous taper from 60 to 40 at the top it got thinner towards the top and then it was cheaper far cheaper because of slipping up uh, form work to have an abrupt change uh, to go from 60 uh, to 40 at one story. And so you've got a really interesting window detail with a reveal at that transitional story. I don't know if I have a picture of it. But. And this is, you know, that, uh, I don't know, Manica place. Oh, this shows that you can see the public space on the bottom, on the ground level. So you can see the water, waterfront. And then uh, the uh, podium is connected with multiple bridges going through the uh, going through the, uh, exoskeletons and connecting to the slab of the towers. Yeah, so the podium is more office space, and it was you know uh, so could a uh, larger concern could have in, uh, a space inside the tower. You cross a bridge and go to, a, to an even larger continuous space, you know, at the base. But this was all, in a way, um, a replacement for the typical parking structure. We were able to occupy this zone and really, I think, make it spatially more interesting and, and uh, you know, programmatically so, uh, you know, at the base. So this is the in between the uh, uh, exoskeleton and window wall, you see. In the lobby. lobby. Yeah. And then this is supposed to be you're supposed to put the arcade on the every buildings. This became an arcade. Right. So, you know, that's an interesting part of the architect's sort of arguments, how you can mount an argument about what constitutes an arcade. They had very conservative sort of homo standards for the development. So every building had to have an arcade. So we were able to convince, uh, you know, the uh, building commission that this exoskeleton uh, you know, was indeed an arcade as well as being the structure. 
and also the each slabs are connected to exoskeleton with tongues. So you see the dark area is the tongues, but also open area you can see through to the ground. And each uh, holes frame the different uh, view, which is very interesting. And then the night view of the lobby space. These spaces are kept meticulously clean. I have to continuously do this, I guess, in all buildings in Dubai because there's you know uh, constant dust. So there's continuous maintenance. Um, they start from uh, one side and keep going whole day, and next day they can keep start doing other way. As so, it's culturally they they uh, they they are. Religious belief is that, that to keep everything perfectly clean. There were also prejudice, prejudices against, you know, raw concrete, for example. So um, the parking garage was done beautifully. I mean, we actually kind of joked that it looked like it was the Sejima Museum. And then they insisted on putting um, uh, facing, marble facing in the parking garage because concrete was seen to be somehow um, not noble enough. Um, so it was, yeah, there were, you know, frictions at that level too, like cultural expectations, you know, a country, you know, a wealthy country and what was acceptable. And then this is a reception desk. Uh, we made it in New Jersey when we sent it out, but it took uh, them one year to construct this. Uh, the reception desk and building have a few years. So you can see how long- Yeah, there's no correlation between, you know, the scale and the amount of time it takes. It took longer to do the damn reception desk. It's no more challenging. <laughs> and then you see the, uh, what is the podium level? From, that's from the water side, yeah. yeah. And I guess, yeah, this is a picture from one of the, yeah. Overteen is in uh, Tom Cruise's uh... movies. <laughs> and you see all 14 in the distance. And is that it, I think? Yeah, that's the kind of night view. And I think that, yeah, that uh, concludes our presentation. So we're delighted to take questions. Thank you so much, Jesse and Annika. It's really, really appreciated beyond beyond I can express words. Um, rather than sort of have just the sort of casual questions, maybe if there's if there is time for any sort of more informal discussion after, but our students uh, they've prepared and we've worked together on some inter interview questions. So okay. can we launch into that. I hope we'll be able to answer. Um, uh, Japeth uh, Ayako. Uh, Editi uh, uh, Pancholi and Alexandra Zatorska. Uh, do you see us, by the way, or do I have to kill this? We can see you. Yeah, okay. A little bit of backlight. Oh, well, I can see myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Alexandra, uh, Japeth, and Editi will um, launch into uh, an uh, interview at this stage. So, I will uh, stop sharing so that you show up larger. So over to over to the students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Nanako. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this wonderful and eye-opening presentation. So my name is Japheth, and on behalf of my um, team, we would like to say thank you once again. Um, I, I was actually privileged to visit um, the business bay in Dubai. So uh -huh. I actually do understand. And this building was actually, actually stood out for me, I would say. Oh. And so, so um, thank you. And so it's a privilege for me to interview you guys. So thank you. Are you from Dubai or? No, I'm not. I'm from Nigeria, but then I traveled I to see. Dubai. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right, so thank you once again. So I'll go right straight to the question and your presentation actually has answered some of these questions. So uh, that's really good. So one question or the first question is, Several years after this project has been completed and a monograph and other publications have been published, in retrospect, can you share your thoughts on the ways in which the O14 project addresses various architectural canons and how this speaks to this genealogy or non-genealogy 
through inversion. Mm. Ah, heavy question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I would like to see it uh, as a project that in a way is, you know, um, adhering to uh, certain canonical models. I mean, I mentioned like you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, St. Mark's Tower. Um, yeah, um, and you know, for, and Melnikov, uh, there are, you know, um, precedents, you know, in a sense that um, we're not kind of up completely in our minds, but whether you like it or not, there are, you know, uh, precedents for this. I mean, and certainly uh, a more immediate one um, came out of uh, a lecture that uh, Sasaki made uh, about his collaborations with Toyo Ito. And so um, in a very general way, I think our project fits into that uh, kind of interesting lineage between, you know, uh, you know, engineering concerns and, and factoring those into uh, the, uh, the kind of form and aesthetics of the project. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you know that we were. Uh, I don't know. I ju we just published a piece on models um, in Log, which you know, kind of describes how blown away we were by the MediaTek Sendai. And while, you know, this project doesn't look like the MediaTek, the concerns that were, you know, part of the discussion between Sasaki and Ito uh, are taken up in, you know, some, maybe some different ways in 014. We were actually disappointed, I and mean, that was the thing I pointed out. That it's and as an architect and as a designer, the thing that really blew us away in the media tech was the competition model, and that we were somewhat let down by the finished building. Uh, and that was I. My analysis was it was because um, Ito was looking at. Uh, and Sasaki were looking at Russian radio towers, which were, uh, you know, had very slender kind of diagrid construction, very lace-like. Uh, but because of, you know, of course, the weight of the slabs and the media attack and um, the way they thought of it, suddenly those diagrids shifted from being these gossamer structures in their competition model to really kind of massive you know, welded pipe diagrams. So my, you know, it, you know, it, it's interesting how one, you know, um, thinks through precedents there, yeah, you know. So I, my, our solution to that was that they should have, what they should have done at the media tech, which would make it closer to their competition model was to have, uh, you know, ha to hang the media tech like that you would have massive supports for a roof and then hang the slabs from that. And then you would get the delicate, uh, you know, kind of gossamer mysterious structure that was so beautiful in their competition model. So, yeah, I mean, these are to me, when you're talking about, you know, references or lineages, it's a living thing. I mean, it's something that you can kind of jump into as a, uh, a young architect too. It's, it's something not, you know, not to kind of strive to be entirely original, but to see where the conversation is and where you could uh, open something up uh, of your own within that conversation. Oh, that's really good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. That makes so much sense. And I totally agree, um, especially with this project, because it was much more experimental. Yeah. And usually that's how it's supposed to be in terms of architecture. And so I think here is a follow-up question um, talking about architecture and, and discipline. So to what extent do you believe architecture to be an autonomous discipline? And does the O14 tower argue yeah. for this position? I think, you know, it's a tricky question um, because I actually believe it. I believe architecture to be both. <laughs> there is a certain... Um, 
autonomy to the discipline. Certainly there would be a way of understanding the discipline as, um, I mean, you're like a composer and you can have you know, written symphonies or music that will never be performed. And that happens in the schools too. And so um, in a certain, at certain moments, it, it can kind of independently develop. Um, and there are even in issues that most people could care less about the public or anyone else, which um, in a certain way is autonomous. At the same time, you know, you are deeply enmeshed in the social and the political and the you know, uh, monetary uh, sort of limits when you're actually doing buildings. And so I would say architecture kind of partakes of both and it has even historically created its own defense mechanism um, to allow that autonomy to exist. And in most cases, yeah, because the general public, unless they're interested, uh, would be indifferent and rightfully so to issues. But you know, the same could be said of probably of I uh, know work by Mozart. Uh, you know, not every you, know, you experience the music, but not, and you would still enjoy it. But then you know whether you have a real kind of technical knowledge of counterpoint is a completely different question. So the two things coexist, you know, I think they always have. Plus, you know, mo money and power is so close to architecture that the discipline has, is mature enough to be able to deal with that as well, even more so, I would say, than the art world. Because it's always been that way. It's always been enmeshed with money and power and all the rest, you know, all of the bad things. Oh, but <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. I totally agree. Um, so <laughs> okay. over to you, Alexandra. Yes. I'm Alexandra. It's, a, it's an honor speaking with you. Thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, no and my questions, um, they relate to refers to two aspects mentioned during the presentation. So uh -huh. first is the context and the second design uh, and construction decision making. So in which ways you believe the O14 tower currently positions itself in relation to context, its climatic uh -huh. context, accelerated urban context of Dubai, and particularly its location and uh -huh. brief as an office tower in a business district? Right. Um, yeah, I haven't been back to the building for about four years, but I think, I guess I should back up for a second. There was a part of the presentation that I didn't show, which was more related to the urban context. And this relates to architects and what they do. So there was a, the, the master plan was done by a big British conglomerate called Halfro. But then for a very short time, uh, OMA uh, was given charge of the master plan. And um, we actually followed some of the really smart suggestions that OMA and REM made. So um, what they did specifically in Business Bay around that site was to suggest that all of the podia be connected. Uh, and so you would have an elevated kind of garden space at the top of the podium. So, and also that, uh, you know, um, to keep the esplanade open. So there were this sort of two levels. There was a public level on the street, and then there was the opportunity, which was never followed, <laughs> um, about having this elevated space. So it wouldn't just be you know, a segmented set of podia or parking garages, but a continuous elevated green space, public space. Uh, so this happens all the time and happens especially with REM. Um, because you know you do what you can do. Um, we could affect everything within the building site. So we actually designed the podium to the height that OMA was suggesting. And if in the future they connected the podium together, it would lock into a really nice, you know, kind of urban scheme. Um, of course, it never happened, but it's it's in the building. It's part of the DNA of the building. Um, and it happened to us in Taiwan the same way. But although in that case, uh, you know, the Kaohsiung, uh, 
uh, where you know we could affect what we could affect. We created uh, an elevated uh, deck that hopefully will continue along the waterfront. It is a fascinating contact, um, con yeah. uh, prospect, and uh, I'm really curious if that's gonna be prosecuted one day. That would be mm -hmm. really amazing. Yes. So also, and so were the decisions, uh, the cautious and explicitly stated at the outset, or maybe alternatively subconscious and very based on intuition and experience? Oh, you mean what part? Yeah, I mean, I sort of explained that, that in a way, I mean, like with the, with the whole uh, stack effect and window wall, it, it sort of came about very indirect. It was a mm -hmm. byproduct, essentially a byproduct of other decisions and that we made. Um, yeah. And then of course, once we were made uh, aware of you know, how that arrangement could work with the gap and the you know, stack effect, then we began to work with it, but it was not something that um, you know, was there at the outset of the project. It was much more conventional. It was an evolution through the, you know, the project. Mm -hmm. You know, the awful thing is it's quite uh, the, the short tower, small tower, but in Dubai, all of these uh, uh, buildings, uh, uh, new buildings are, are very tall. And then uh, they are made as a window wall structure. Uh, so that the, uh, the building had to have a columns inside and then facade had to have a different structural system. But in the case of all 14, if we make it window wall, uh, and then we had to have a column here inside. So the, uh, the, the space become very limited. Yeah, I mean, it was also, you know, we, I think we were really questioning just the plethora of import technologies and buildings in Dubai, like that just automatically we're doing window wall buildings in an environment, you know, that um, of intense heat and sun. Uh, and so I guess indirectly through influences like Corbusier, the whole idea of a brise soleil, which came before the stack effect was something that was we thought was more appropriate and culturally it resonated with, you know, uh, building type, very ancient building types in the area. The funny thing is in Dubai, every building is so different. So I don't know if, uh, if you can argue that we had to make a, a urban context. Some kind of uniformity you had to have, but the Dubai is other way around. Well, yeah, we were in a sense working against a, a kind of very conservative uh, kind of postmodern master plan, set of master plan guidelines. So that's why I mentioned the arcade and the base and all of these uh, sort of uh, rules, which fortunately, um, you know, the uh, administrators, people administrated the master plan uh, were flexible enough uh, to accept a completely different kind of building type. So yeah, it was a it, yeah, it was a kind of uh, an interesting battle, I would say. Mm -hmm. between, you know, and, but also that the building, in a weird way, affiliated with the nature more than the buildings around it. <laughs> like how you define the context. You don't want to really make it look like all these other buildings anyway. So it, then it became this weird artificial natural building in the midst of, you know, the more normative, uh, you know, curtain wall towers. <laughs> yes. That's yeah, something that was... Gary is very good at doing, actually. <laughs> um, you know, like you should, it, yeah, he, he finds features of the context which are not normally recognized and that's how he argues for um, being contextual rather than copying the buildings around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is the question, what is context? Right, it's not, you know, automatic at all. I mean, it's something that you should be rhetorically as an architect, you know, questioning and inventing. It's about rhetoric too. I mean, it's yeah. about how you argue for these things. You would agree that the process were more form finding than form giving. I would say, I mean, it was both. It was both. 
<laughs> there was form, you know, we have formal um, inclinations, and but then there was enough flexibility to see how it would, you know, change, you know, how it would be modified. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I am going to give microphone to Aditi. Hi. 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 Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And it's a pleasure to talk to you. I would go straight to the question since we are okay. uh, already over time. Um, so uh, in our seminar, uh, we are looking at our analysis to a set of different themes. And uh, your O14 tower makes a bold aesthetic statement about mass, heaviness, and solid materiality. Mm. So this week's theme is massing and materiality. Uh, through O14's interest in uh, occlusion, opacity, and the inversion of lightness in terms of the methodology and procedure as the project was um, designed and developed uh, mm -hmm. with respect to form, materiality, and constructional uh, logic of the perforated um, exoskeleton envelope. Uh, can you uh, share with us how you uh, generated designed and evaluated the geometry of the envelope, uh, like the size of the grid, the openings, and the relation of solid and void conditions? Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, it's been a while, so I wouldn't be able to give you the exact dimensions, but we basically worked with five different opening sizes, um, which uh, were more or less determined by the, the kind of the diagrid. Uh, of structure um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier in the discussion, there was a, an interesting kind of iterative process back and forth with our engineer um, giving us uh, you know the ability to essentially uh, allow the holes to drift that they had a certain, uh, space within which they could move, uh, you know, to modulate that diagrid. So when we started working through the problem, there were, I guess, um, it was a kind of setup. You can see in, I don't know, is this slide visible? Maybe not. But anyway, um, the, the envelope uh, had all of the forces finally had to track down to the ring beam and to the columns below. So there were a set of streams in the facade that we were routing forces along or shunting them to main streams. And that was a, a kind of a guiding, um, you know, once we had the parameters for the size of the holes and then established concrete strength, and then it there were aesthetic issues um, about you know trying to kind of defeat the obvious reading of the diagram, and so it was about coordinating a whole bunch of concerns at once, and of course where we would put large openings and where we would have smaller openings, you know, in the uh, in the offices behind. So it was a a lot of it was. Um, well, there were interesting uh, paths through this problem, which uh, didn't go anywhere at the time. So parametrics were used. Um, we had uh, what was it? Roland Snooks, who's now, um, Tom knows Roland well. Roland was in the office um, and was there uh, initially really to kind of work through the problem of writing scripts to deal with gradients and you know the, the kind of managing this rule set. Um, and we were continuously unhappy with the rules. Like they looked too mechanical. Um, and so actually what the, the automation of the project really worked very well in the way he constructed the building set and the uh, capacity to update changes. But then most of the scripting for us, we rejected. And so we went on manual, on autopilot. We actually used Photoshop filters. We used a whole bunch of other ways of uh, kind of dealing with the gradients. Roland said we were, um, you know, he, 
he, he was very annoyed with us. What would happen would be, um, he would set a rule for gradients for the whole tower and it, it was like, this is really bad. It looks really all, I know, stiff and um, it's not good. And so he would have to make the rules get smaller and smaller and smaller areas had to get new scripts. So it was absurd. At a certain point, it was faster just to do it, just to kind of go manual and adjust things in a manual way. So that was an interesting kind of um, point. And I don't know if that, you know, uh, would still be valid. It was 12 years ago, but at that point, um, you know, that was sort of the limit of how one could deal with the automation and the scripting on the kind of aesthetic level and where we felt we had to take over. Like fly by wire versus Chuck Yeager taking over the X1, you know, flying the plane. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would follow with one more question. Uh, so um, how uh, has the O4 team project influenced your projects, uh, which has been designed since O4 team? And can you uh, speculate on how the project has influenced the design and construction uh, by others in the discipline and profession? Um, you want to answer that? Can't answer that. <laughs> well, I mean, certainly one of the things that we did um, was to, you know, the it, uh, O fourteen represented a certain moment in the process, and when we went into another competition, this time for the Shenzhen Airport, uh, we felt we had to kind of, um, I don't know do the next iteration of O14 and you know, of course it was a horizontal structure, but it's two. So we added even more freedom to the system. Um, basically, I mean, if, in terms of carrying over O14 to the next project, I would say the Shenzhen airport is exactly that. I mean, that we, uh, the openings in O14 are perpendicular. Uh, and then we added another degree of freedom to the concrete shell and began to deal with oblique projection. It's, uh, it's uh, according to the uh, some movement because the airport is very important to consider the movement of light. So we slide uh, two surfaces like this, and yeah. then uh, you you can really control the movement of sun. So direct light versus reflected light. So we got, you know, yeah, we added another dimension to the idea of a whole, a tube with holes in it, I guess. And then how it, it could, and also the, you know, the design, uh, uh, you know, of a shell and of lo long span concrete. So I would, there was another tower that never got built as well and for Mexico. Um, which also kind of carried forward O for teen ideas. In terms of the discipline, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, hard to say. I mean, certainly Shenzhen Airport was um, lifted pretty strongly by, I think, SOM in their airport in India. Oh, yeah, they built it. Yeah, they built it. So, you know, it had influence that way, much to our, you know, dismay. <laughs> but they didn't, it had other, you know, it was more historical, I would say. But I think they were uh, definitely looking at long span concrete and uh, kind of plasticity. Thank you so much. That answers it very well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Jesse and Nanako. Um, some of what you just um, um, said right now actually answers some of the question I'm about to answer, because, or ask rather. So this question is like a two in one question. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to ask anyways. So sure. I, yeah, all right. So within your portfolio, um, within your portfolio of works, is there a trajectory of a set of continued interest and preoccupations in terms of methodology and tectonic focus of your practice, which can be located in the old 14 tower? That's one part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, 
regarding your long-standing interest in computation, structural behaviors, network typologies, in which ways do you learn from your experience as designers? And, um, and where are the continuities and breaks in your um, body of work? Um, a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> A practice actually started in 1983. So it, it's a long history at that point. Nobody had a computer. And even we, we are teaching at Columbia, but nobody had a computer. So computer came quite late. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there are you know, it, 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 the, there are a whole series of sort of um, overall projects within the office. I mean, that we usually go from one piece of work to the next. And so we don't make the argument like some offices do that every project in a way is uh, original or starting from scratch. There are, you know, a series of uh, longer term projects that we you know, not just one, but that we um, typically kind of address, uh, you know, when we work on a, any particular project. So, I don't know, I mean, there was a whole, uh, there were a whole series, you know, as a young office, this may be of interest to you guys. I mean, as a young office, of course, you don't get the chance to do larger projects, um, but, we, you know, so you get the work that you get. So our earliest work uh, were, you know, landscape projects and then um, kind of smaller structures uh, in gardens. Uh, and so, I don't know, experiments with structure happened at that, you know, very small scale, even, you know, doing fence posts of a particular kind or pergolas or swings or, and then, you know, um, we started doing competitions, which was something that's not so popular these days, but it was something that um, was very much a part of the scene, you know, as young teachers at Columbia, everybody would enter the same competition. I mean, Tom is well aware of, you know, the culture of that at the AA and how important it, it was. Um, and so those interests that we had in the small structures that we were building could be then uh, tried out at a larger scale and competition format. So the Yokohama Port Terminal, which was a super important competition for our generation, uh, was sort of the culmination of all of those sectional experiments we were doing with much smaller structures. So yeah, I mean, we kind of finally came to a really kind of big resolution, which we couldn't build, but we're, we were building little things all the time. So everything is useful, I would say, even as a young practice, you can, you know, it can be very simple and humble in terms of its scale and budget, but it, uh, you know, I would take it as seriously as the big projects. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I totally agree with uh, what you just said. Everything is useful. And that's yeah. actually the quote, um, which is God is in the detail. So every yeah. little detail matters, even in the smaller project, yeah. all the way to the bigger project. So yes. It's the I same thing. It's I mean, a piece yeah. of furniture, you know, like the great furniture of modernism were really miniature sort of um, essays on what the architecture should be in the most simple form. That's you know, for Boo or Mies or any of those people. Mark Stans. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being gracious with your time. Sure. Um, we really appreciate you, um, Jesse, and we appreciate you, Nanako. And so... Um, Are you uh, related to Somi? Related to who? Somi Delano. No, I'm not. No? <laughs> He's from Nigeria. I had 
him <laughs> as a student. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. I, I don't know him. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Professor Tom. Well, uh, thank you really uh, uh, so pleasure. much, Jesse and Anna. <laughs> very, very special, very, very private treat we're having today. Uh, it's really, uh, I, I think this is one of the, the few benefits this week of COVID is being able to get huh? the two of you uh, <laughs> a very private seminar. <laughs> I feel really grateful. So, um, on, you know, on behalf of our students, I thank you. On behalf of the director of the program, David Diamond, and our dean, uh, it's really quite a quite a pleasure. We'll um, we will be transcribing and uh -huh. using the work uh, the, in, in the, uh, within the context uh -huh. of the seminar, uh, and the students will be producing a, a, a book which is not uh, has no has no um, uh, contract for publication, but is uh, at this stage just the academic uh -huh. exercise of compiling everything together. So uh, I'll share that one. Yeah, once I mean, and speak. also we're happy to you know supply more material or whatever you need. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, really appreciate it. Thank you really so, so much. Uh, wish you well. <laughs> good health. Uh, uh, you know, best of luck with all the all the projects in uh, in Thank Taiwan. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you Thank so you much, everybody. Thank you. You're very grateful. Bye.